gives us Bible and current events from a Christian perspective. Battling spiritual wickedness in high places, one podcast at a time. Welcome to the High Places Podcast. Hi, my name is Jim, and the first thing you'll notice is that the name of the podcast has changed. We are no longer the Pondering from the Porch. See, I even got the name wrong. The Ponderings from the Porch podcast. First of all, too many words. Second, too much alliteration. Uh, third, uh, it was from an old uh, video series. I was worried about uh, confusion maybe uh, with that, and nobody knows what Ponderings are. So we changed the name. Um, I like the new logo too, by the way. Uh, it also aligns more closely with the purpose of the podcast, uh, which is actually taken from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. And uh, you'll recognize this verse right away. For we, re- we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so that's the purpose, as we discussed uh, last time. Uh, The purpose of this podcast is to look at what's going on in our world, look at current events, look at cultural things, and uh, see what's behind all this, uh, what's really going on, uh, what the enemy is doing through these actions uh, and events that we see in our daily lives. This week, we're going to talk about, if you can believe it, Election 2020. That's right. We're two months removed from the latest election, 22 months removed from the next election, and the 2020 presidential race has already started. So I'm glad that the uh, politicians took two months to actually get some work done. Oh, wait a minute. They went on vacation for December. So I'm glad the politicians took four or five weeks to get some work done um, before campaigning again. So that's exciting. So now nothing will get passed over the next two years because nobody will want to give anybody a victory that they can claim on their uh, in their campaign commercials. And yeah, so that'll be fun. Uh, so the uh, new Congress started, I guess, this week, and there's already fireworks around that. And uh, so we can talk about that because from a political standpoint, uh, there are things going on and have been going on that kind of actually lead towards uh, what we see in end, end times prophecy. Uh, and um, this, and neither uh, major political party in the United States is immune from this. Uh, they just have different ways of going about it. And we'll talk about that uh, in just a little bit. But first of all, I wanted to cover my affiliation so that everybody knows where I'm coming from. Um, and, uh, and so the people don't have to try to guess, um, what's driving the things uh, that I'm saying. So I am neither a registered Democrat or registered Republican. In fact, I have not voted for a Democrat or a Republican since 1992. And, and then I voted for Bill Clinton. Uh, so, um, I don't have a, uh, dog in the, uh, two party system fight, uh, because I don't believe in a two party system. There is nothing in the constitution about that. Uh, actually our first president, George Washington warned about the dangers of political parties. Uh, but this whole two party system idea is something that the two major parties like to propagate, uh, cause they like to convince people that if they don't vote for one of the two major parties, that they're throwing their vote away. My favorite story about that is the election of 1992, where you had George H.W. Bush, uh, Bill Clinton, and Ross Perot running. And the big knock on Perot was that he was the third party candidate. And if you vote for him, you're throwing your vote away. So uh, he still managed to get 19% of the vote and uh, kept uh, Bill Clinton from getting over 50%. So it was interesting because there was polling done after that election. And they asked people who they would have voted for if they just voted their conscience. And 41% of the people said they would vote 
for Ross Perot. And that would have been enough for him to win the presidency. And the follow-up question to that was, well, then why didn't you vote that way? And the response was, we didn't want to throw our vote away. So they wouldn't have thrown their vote away. They would have elected a president, uh, someone who was outside of the two major parties. Uh, but because the two major parties have done such a phenomenal job of convincing people that they're throwing their vote away if they don't vote for them, people buy into that. Uh, so I don't vote for the two major parties because, um, frankly, I think, I think they're just two sides of the same coin. They uh, pander to different constituencies, but in the end, they kind of have the same goals. It's this centralization of power, and it, it's not just limited to these political parties or even this country. Uh, power has tended to concentrate over time. And that's why when this country was set up, the founders set it up as a republic, uh, a country of independent states. That's where we get the name, United States. But the state was its own entity. And there was supposed to be a weak central government because they had just come out from underneath a monarchy uh, and a parliamentary system that controlled them. So they wanted a weak central government, but power tends to centralize over time. And so both parties do it. Uh, the Republicans have to be a bit more constrained because uh, some of their constituents uh, don't like centralized power. So, And now I'm generalizing, of course, because there are exceptions on both sides. Uh, one of my favorite is for the Democrats, um, Harry Reid uh, used to be um, the majority leader in the Senate when the Democrats controlled the Senate. He's anti-abortion because he's a Mormon. Uh, and so, but you didn't hear him talk about that too much because it goes against the narrative and um, what you say is way more important than what you actually do uh, these days. So, um, but, so there's exceptions on both sides, but for the most part, there is a centralization of power. The Democrats just happen to be more open about it and um, uh, really are huge proponents of centralized power, big government, lots of programs, uh, getting people dependent on government. Um, the Republicans have to dance around it a little bit more, but um, uh, both are uh, globalist organizations, uh, and we'll talk about the danger of that uh, and how that actually fits into Bible prophecy. Um, but uh, you look at prior to Obamacare, for example, do you know what the largest entitlement program ever enacted in the United States was? Some people say Social Security, but it was actually Medicare Part D, the prescription drug benefit, uh, enacted under George W. Bush with a Republican Congress. Um, the Patriot Act was passed uh, during that time, um, which uh, infringes on a lot of constitutional freedoms, uh, but gives the government a lot of centralized power. The problem with that is uh, when they pass these things, in that case, uh, in the wake of 9-11, nobody can guarantee that that power given to the government is not going to be misused by some administration in the future. Uh, in fact, it didn't even take that long for a misuse of the Patriot Act. The first prosecutions under the Patriot Act were actually for offshore gambling websites, not terrorists. Uh, but the government was given this power. And so when you give uh, a government power or any oligarchy, uh, which we are now under in this country and probably have been for quite some time, um, you don't know how they're going to use that power once they have it. So that's the danger of, um, of this centralized power. And like I said, both parties uh, do it to uh, different degrees. They just have to, uh, like I said, the Republicans have to be more quiet about it and do it in a little bit more of a backdoor way. Uh, because of their constituents, uh, which they need, um, because they have, uh, there are just fewer Republicans than there are Democrats. But so the Republicans are really um, big on turnout. So they have to turn out their base. Uh, you certainly saw this in 2012 when they nominated uh, Mitt Romney, uh, but a lot of Bible believing Christians stayed at home during that election. They didn't vote for the Democrat, but they, um, they stayed home and that was enough to lose the race. 
for the Republicans. So there are certain groups that the Republicans have to play to. Um, but a lot of the party establishment, they don't want to deal with social issues. They want to deal with business and tax cuts and things like that, global trade, et cetera, et cetera. So the news this week, Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren has uh, established an exploratory committee. Um, <laughs> and so that sounds like semantics, but actually from a legal standpoint, a campaign standpoint, that allows her to start raising funds. It also allows her to transfer her money from her recent senatorial campaign to this uh, new campaign, this new organization. So there's actually uh, some real things behind that verbiage. But um, I, I, if anybody's surprised that Elizabeth Warren is running for president, uh, they haven't been listening to her for the last year or two. Um, so that's already happened. There's already some people that are uh, that have announced a while ago, kind of second tier uh, type of people. Um, but we can see this has already started. In fact, I think the Democrats, their first, uh, presidential debates are actually slated for June of this year. They're supposed to have six of them in 2019 and six of them in 2020. So they're already going on this. And so, wow, this is going to be a really long 22 months. Um, yeah. I don't know if anything's going to get done. It's going to, it's just going to be crazier and crazier. Um, but so, uh, we'll see what this all means, uh, because, uh, like I said, it has, uh, uh, some relevance when we look at Bible prophecy, uh, because in the end times, we're going to have centralized government, right? We're going to have, uh, a one world leader. Um, and so you can kind of see the makings of all this now. And uh, some of the new uh, Democrats that have come into Congress, there it's funny because they call themselves, um, uh, was it social Democrats or something like Democratic Socialists, Democratic Socialists, which um, socialist is just a nice, uh, friendlier term than Marxist. But if you look at it from a policy standpoint, you're really talking Marxism. And so the danger of that is Karl Marx was just adamantly anti-Christian. And so you can see a lot of the policies and worldviews of um, people who adopt that mentality, uh, not just in this country now, um, but around the world and throughout history. Uh, they were atheist uh, regimes, uh, the Soviet Union, China. Look at the persecution that's going on uh, just recently in China against Christians and against churches. Uh, and so um, the uh, totalitarian governments do not like competition. Uh, they want uh, people to view them as God because they don't want to have uh, a higher authority that people can look to. So in this country, you see the same thing uh, from the Marxists who want to come to power. Um, you look at what they want to do. They want to centralize power in government um, very overtly. Um, but you also look at their stands on moral issues and issues that affect Christians. So they're uh, usually openly abor uh, in favor of abortion. Um, and that one's always funny to me because they're in favor of uh, freedom of choice, as they like to call it, when it comes to killing children. But if you want to keep your child and educate your child, they're against freedom of choice when it comes to education, uh, for example, they don't want school choice. They fight tooth and nail against it. So if you want to kill your children, you have freedom. If you want them to grow up and be educated and have uh, opportunities, uh, no freedom for you. Um, because if, they're, if, if you're going to allow your kids to live, then the government has to indoctrinate them properly. And that happens in government schools uh, where they learn uh, that it's okay to, you know, kill your children, uh, that it's okay, um, to, uh, propagate and promote, um, perverse lifestyles, um, where they're taught, uh, evolution, uh, as we, uh, talked about last time, denying God as creator. So there, um, if you're going to keep your child, um, the, uh, the Marxists want to teach them how to think and what to think. Uh, and um, there are consequences for not thinking the way uh, you're told to think. 
I, it's, it's interesting too. I heard, uh, uh, I think it was, uh, Hitchens, uh, make a comment on this that people that hold those views, it's, it's not just that they have a difference of opinion with people, but they believe because they hold those views, uh, tolerating these different lifestyles, being in favor of, uh, a woman's right to kill her child, um, et cetera, et cetera, that they are, they have the moral high ground and that they are in a morally superior position and that people that disagree with them aren't just people that have a difference of opinion, but they are morally inferior. There's something wrong with them. Uh, why do people keep using the term fascists or Nazis or comparing people to Hitler? Because it's not a policy issue. It's a moral issue. And people, uh, people, uh, on the left, uh, who hold these positions want to paint opposition as having a moral deficiency. Um, because then you're allowed to do different things, uh, and deny different things. Nobody would say that, you know, Hitler has a right to express his opinions. And so you see this, uh, going on now. You see it on college campuses, especially the last couple of years. There's no debate anymore. What are people doing? They're literally shouting down people they don't want to listen to. This is, um, this should terrify anybody who's got to live in this country over the next 50 years because these are supposedly the best and the brightest and the future leaders of, you know, politics, business, education, media, law, etc. And they are literally, it's literally like dealing with a three year old. If they hear something they don't like, they literally scream and throw a tantrum. The only thing they're not doing is falling on the floor and flailing around and crying. Um, but <laughs> as the presidential campaign moves forward, who knows what will happen. Um, and so that's to the point where we've gotten. So you, uh, there is a moral issue with this. So the same people who want to criticize uh, Christians, uh, conservatives um, on moral grounds are themselves uh, invoking morality and saying that people don't have the right to express their opinion um, because they are immoral for not embracing these ideas that the leftists embrace. And so when things are presented from that standpoint, then people can start to justify anything. If, if one doesn't have a right to express oneself, uh, if they don't have to be heard at all or tolerated, um, if they are morally inferior, then there's no limit to what people can do to them. Uh, that's why, um, if, if, uh, President Trump has done anything, and just for the record, I did not vote for the man. Uh, he does not represent my values and I will not vote for him in the future. Um, but the one thing he has done is taken the shackles off liberals because of his, um, some would say very outrageous behavior and statements. Um, they don't feel that the, the his opponents, uh, people on the left don't feel that they have to limit themselves or constrain themselves anymore. Uh, you've already seen it, uh, this week with a new, uh, incoming, uh, member of the house using, um, extremely profane language about, um, impeaching the president. Uh, and so, um, and so at the highest levels, we see, we see that people are feeling unrestrained. So when the Democrats come back in power, which inevitably they will, the pendulum keeps swinging back and forth. Um, one has to wonder about the degree of retribution, uh, because you already see this going on against Christians in this country now, whether it's Christian business owners, uh, whether it's, uh, people in the workplace. Um, we've heard about this at different tech companies that if you hold certain views, um, there's, um, there's an impact of that, or you, one has to keep themselves silent. And so we're already in a culture of self-censorship. That's how you know we're, uh, we have the makings if we're not there already, uh, of at least a very shadow totalitarian culture because the government doesn't need to censor people anymore 
people have been conditioned to self-censor. Um, and so, um, as you see already these things being impacted, um, one wonders how bad it's going to be when uh, the left takes over power again and will be able to justify any outrageous behavior, uh, number one, just because of their pent-up frustrations, um, but number two, because the bar has been lowered for what is acceptable behavior. I think Daniel Patrick Moynihan uh, called it uh, defining deviancy downward. Um, he was referring to something else and a different president a long time ago, Democrat from New York, Moynihan was. Um, but so it makes you wonder. The example of the um, baker in Colorado who just won his Supreme Court case uh, over not you know, having to bake cakes for gay weddings. He won that. And so what happened next? The Colorado Civil Rights Commission went after him again, again. So what did they think was going to happen here? This has already been settled by the highest court in the land. Um, but they still went after him. So the government is not feeling constrained by uh, legal decisions that they don't like. Uh, that's terrifying because that's a sign of lawlessness. It's a sign of lawlessness. And we see in the Bible talking about, you know, the man of lawlessness. So this whole mentality where lawlessness becomes acceptable, uh, we see this with the immigration debate. And so wherever you are on that side, the bigger picture issue is we have... Um, uh, a major political party, the largest political party in this country, uh, basically saying, ignore the immigration laws of this country. Um, we have immigration laws. We have a million people a year who lawfully gain their citizenship in this country. The United States grants citizenship to more people every single year than all the other countries of the world combined, combined. Nobody grants as, as many people citizenship every single year as we do. But what you see is uh, advocates for people who essentially cut in line ahead of the people who are going through the process. So imagine you're at the grocery store. There's long lines. You're waiting patiently, and there's a whole bunch of people ahead of you, and someone pushes their cart through and cuts in front of everybody else. And you're like, wow, what nerve of somebody to do that. Certainly the checkout clerk will tell them to go to the back of the line. Imagine your outrage if the checkout clerk started checking out that person's groceries and ringing them up. That, that means cutting in front of line, in the front of the line paid off. It worked. And so you would, you would be more disgusted by the fact that the checkout clerk allowed that to happen and went along with it. Uh, as you were about the person who cut in line in the first place. And then at that point, you have lawlessness because everybody else in line is like, well, why am I waiting in line? Why don't I just cut ahead too? And so that's how you have this breakdown. Um, and so the rights that we have, the legal structures that we have, you can kind of see these being eroded a uh, little by little. Uh, the whole idea of borders uh, eroded. Again, this is a globalist thing. This is, uh, I think the UN just passed something about, you know, freedom of migration. This idea that there are no sovereign countries and that uh, anybody can just go where they want and the laws of a country aren't necessarily any things that have to be abided by. Because again, if they don't match up with the priorities of uh, these certain groups, then they're immoral and therefore can be ignored. And so how do you wind up with a one world leader? How do you uh, wind up with a centralized government? We can see the pieces of this being put in place today. So it's not that there's going to be some massive revolutionary thing that suddenly is going to put somebody in power. We have a hard time imagining a one world leader. Although if you go back to say the end of the Cold War, uh, that was fighting global, global communism. And 
one of the things we were fighting against was this idea that communism, a totalitarian regime, would control the world. And so um, the idea of that was so remote and repulsive to people. You fast forward now, though, and you have global organizations like the EU, like the UN, who put their own um, priorities, laws, treaties ahead of sovereign nations. Uh, the EU has its own court, and so the Supreme Court in a given country can make a ruling, and if the people lose that decision, they can appeal to the European Court of Justice. And so you have these supranational organizations that are already in place and already functional. So this idea of the beast who's colloquially called the Antichrist, although that word isn't used in Revelation, it's only used in uh, John's epistles, I think only in the first one. Uh, it might be in the second as well. Um, and John wrote Revelation. So if he was going to attribute uh, the Antichrist uh, label to the beast, he would have called him the Antichrist, you'd think, because he'd already been uh, using that term. Um, but the beast, uh, this one world leader, um, it, it, you get the sense it's not going to have to be anything particularly revolutionary. You see all the makings of this happening already. And this is actually talked about. Let me click over to my Bible here. You see this in Revelation chapter 13. It talks about the beast that came out of the... Uh, we should actually just read this. This is a good chapter. Chapter 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw the beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. And so that's the devil that's behind this individual, that's behind the beast. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. So that's really amazing. So someone's going to have an injury that's, that's deadly. Uh, but he recovers, and the world is amazed by this. And so we already live in a celebrity culture. Um, so you can imagine how something like that would impact uh, people. Um, and they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. That's amazing. People are worshiping the devil. Um, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, so three and a half years. Um, so that's halfway through the seven-year uh, end times. Uh, and so that's, a, that's an interesting verse as well. Uh, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy. Well, we already live in a culture where, um, and people would tell you our current president uh, does this, uh, uh, very... Um, uh, boisterous, very uh, prideful. Uh, we see it with professional athletes. Um, the idea of humility is uh, long gone. And so people are um, uh, very quick to speak uh, great things uh, about themselves. Um, and so if we continue, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So look at that. This centralized leader, this is why this stuff is dangerous, the makings of this centralized power. It was given unto him to make war with the saints, with the saints. So those are people that get saved during that seven-year period. Um, so what's he do with this power? He goes after God's people. Uh, and to overcome them. And so he's successful at doing this. And he's given power over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So over the whole world. So this centralized power, it isn't just something that, you know, we can kind of watch from the sidelines. This has a direct impact on fellow believers, the believers who uh, came to Christ after the rapture and uh, are still in this world. 
uh, this is going to have a very terrible impact on them. Um, and so uh, this is kind of the danger. We can, we can talk in future episodes about, uh, and I'm sure we will as the election goes on, um, how this sort of power and this sort of mentality is affecting the lives of Christians already in our culture and uh, how it seems uh, it looks like it'll grow worse and worse and then in the end here you can see the total manifestation where the whole world is behind this person and what are they doing they're attacking god's people and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him worship him whose names are not written in the book of the lamb slain from the found the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world if any man have an ear, let him hear. So, you know, that's interesting. That's interjected. So it's like, hey, pay attention to this. Um, and so it goes on to talk about uh, this. It talks about the false prophet uh, that'll, um, that will, again, do amazing things, miraculous things, uh, actually. But the, the famous uh, verses in here, um, at the end, people will recognize and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, so that's the false prophet, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So again, God's people. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and, know that, and that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. And that's where we get our 666 uh, references from. But you can see the impact of this centralized power. And so, not that I'm uh, telling people they should vote this way or that way, um, observe what's going on. Because like I said, uh, you can see both major political parties in this country uh, consolidate power. Uh, one is just more overt about it, and one has to be uh, more subtle and measured uh, simply because of the constituencies that support them. But it's something to be aware of, and we're going to see the impact of this. And so it's a warning. It's a warning to be aware of exactly what the devil's up to, um, we can see uh, prophecies fulfilled in this, and we can see how uh, kind of the pieces are being po uh, positioned on the chessboard. And so for those of us who are saved, who God has saved, uh, who Jesus has redeemed, this should actually give us some degree of comfort that as we see these things coming about, we can understand how we will get from where we are to what the world looks like as it's described in Revelation. Um, we can see those dots being connected, and it's a very clear path, and we can see the world trending that way, and it has been for decades, um, particularly after the fall of communism uh, in Europe, uh, because um, that, was the, that was the one thing that was kind of, you know, keeping everyone pressing away from this centralized power because they just didn't want to be labeled or associated with communism. But now we have this neo-Marxism, this uh, softer, kinder, gentler face uh, of Marxism, um, this socialism thing. Um, and it's very popular. I think I saw something the other day that uh, millennials have a much more positive view of socialism uh, than they do of sort of capitalism democracy. Um, so you can kind of see how the population is going along with this as well. But as I said, it should give us a degree of comfort because we can see that the Bible is true, that, the, that God has already talked about these things and said that these things would happen. And so as we see them taking place and we can go, oh yeah, I can see that this is going to lead to exactly what God said, that means we can trust him. And so for those of us whom God has saved, that means we can trust the salvation he's given us too. We can trust the price that Jesus paid for our souls to take our sins away. Uh, the repentance that he's granted us, the obedient faith that he's given us, we can trust him because if he can be right 
about these huge world altering things. And we can look at past prophecy. We can look at history. We can look at what's going to happen in the future by looking at the trends of our current times. If we can trust those things, uh, which will be over at some point when this world is over, how much more can we trust what he's done for us individually to save our souls that'll go on for eternity? Um, if he's taken so much time to show himself trustworthy on the things of the world that are ending, uh, so much more uh, we should trust him with our eternal souls uh, because he cares so much more for those um, because they are precious to him and they last forever. And he was, uh, he was willing to become a man and uh, take on the burden of the punishment of our sins. Uh, Jesus did that for us. Um, that's how much God cares for us and how much concern he has for us. And that just shows how much we can trust his goodness. Um, that if he's trustworthy in worldly things, he's trustworthy in eternal things. And that is a comfort. So as all these things go on, um, we can believe the Bible and we don't have to be anxious for anything. Uh, we just have to be aware. And that will give us the power, courage, opportunity to share this with other people and show them what God says. And we can say, look, this is what God said things will be like. Look at what's going on around you. Aren't you seeing this happening? Aren't you seeing us heading down that path? Can't you see how the Bible is right about this, that God is trustworthy? And so he's trustworthy about the consequences of sin too. Uh, and he's also very trustworthy about the salvation and the reprieve um, that we uh, have available through Jesus Christ, um, who paid the price for those sins so that we don't have to uh, deal with the eternal punishment that we all deserve. We can benefit from God's amazing grace. And so that's the first round of the politics. There'll be a whole lot more to talk about in the next 22 months. Can you believe it? I wonder when the robocalls are going to start. Um, but uh, it should be exciting. It should be fun. There's already some interesting things going on. There's some uh, funny personalities uh, showing, up, showing up in politics. If nothing else, it provides fantastic theater. Uh, who needs to watch television? I don't even own a TV. There's nothing good on there to rot your mind. Um, uh, but uh, who needs to? You can just you can just watch the political stuff. This is better than any Broadway show. It's uh, certainly more humorous um, and dramatic and ridiculous, and you just have to smile and shake your head sometimes. But be aware of what's going on behind it, because the evil that's behind all these things, uh, probably unbeknownst to the actors involved, um, the evil is not funny. It's very serious, and it's all to undermine God. And it's all to undermine um, people's openness uh, to the gospel and to God's grace. And so for that, we need to be aware of the devil's devices uh, so that we can warn others and tell them about the grace of Jesus. So that's it. We'll talk again soon. Uh, keep your eyes out. Oh, yeah. Um, feel free to email us podcast at jesusforsinners.com. We've got some things set up on the website. There's a podcast page now uh, where you can go to. We're also on uh, Stitcher, uh, Google Play Music, Spotify, and we're still working to get on Apple. We'll see if Apple will let us on. Um, but uh, you can get to all these on the website or you can search for us uh, on those uh, other sites. Uh, the High Places podcast is what we're under now. So High Places, you'll find us that way. And uh, tell all your friends. Uh, subscribe, and we'll keep this going. Alrighty. Talk to you later. Thanks very much. God bless everybody. Bye.